Hello, and welcome to the Fighting Moose Podcast. I'm your host and narrator, Jason Hendrickson. This is a podcast where I retell stories, some fictional and some historical, that can be enjoyed by people of all ages. Today, we get into some Greek mythology with the story The Curse of Echo from the book Children of the Dawn, written by Elsie Finnamore Buckley. Today's story comes about from John and his online schooling. During one of his school days, his teacher was talking, and somehow she started getting some feedback in her speakers, which resulted in an echo-like sound. Therefore, I went searching for an echo story because I remembered this story from studying the Greek mythology in the past. Before I did this story, I did find a story about echoes and cave people, but after I read the story and recorded it, I was not happy with it, so I scrapped it and went with this one that we're reading today. I hope that you had a great Thanksgiving on Thursday. Looking at my calendar, we are now 27 days away from Christmas. That's crazy. Hopefully, you are getting some Christmas shopping done and getting your houses all decorated. My wife's new TV show is a show about Christmas decorating, which I think is on Netflix, but I can't remember. When that show comes on the TV, I find something else to do. I hope you enjoy these last few days of November, and if you want to send some peanut butter cookies my way, I won't refuse. I'm just kidding. You don't need to send cookies. Unless you're listening, Mom, then send a lot. Now... Let's turn to today's story. I hope you enjoy. Let's begin. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. The Curse of Echo In the flowery groves of Helicon, Echo was once a fair nymph who, hand in hand with her sisters, sported along the green lawns and by the side of the mountain streams. Among them, all her feet were the lightest and her laugh the merriest, and in the telling of tales, not one of them could touch her. So if ever any among them were plotting mischief in their hearts, they would say to her, Echo, thou weaver of words, go thou and sit beside Hera in her bower, and beguile her with a tale that she come not forth and find us. See thou make it a long one, Echo, and we will give thee a garland to twine in thy hair. And Echo would laugh a gay laugh, which rang through the grove. What will you do when she tires of my tales? she asked. When that time comes, we shall see, said they. So with another laugh, she would trip away and cast herself on the grass at Hera's feet. When Hera looked upon Echo, her stern brow would relax, and she would smile upon her and stroke her hair. What hast thou come for now, thou sprite? she would ask. I had a great longing to talk with thee, great Hera, she would answer, and I have a tale, a wondrous new tale to tell thee. Thy tales are as many as the risings of the sun, Echo, and each one of them as long as an old man's beard. The day is yet young, mother, she would say, and the tales I have told thee before are as mud which is trampled underfoot by the side of the one I shall tell thee now. Go to, then, said Hera, and if it pleases me, I will listen to the end. So Echo would sit upon the grass at Hera's feet, and with her eyes fixed upon her face, she would tell her tale. She had the gift of words, and, moreover, she had seen and heard many strange things which she alone could tell of. These she would weave into romances, adding to them as best pleased her, or taking from them at will, 
for the best of tale tellers are those who can lie but who mingle in with their lies some grains of truth which they have picked from their own experience and Hera would forget her watchfulness and her jealousies and listen entranced while the magic of Echo's words made each scene live before her eyes. Meanwhile, the nymphs would sport to their heart's content and never fear her anger. But at last came the black day of reckoning when Hera found out the prank which Echo had played upon her so long, and the fire of her wrath flashed forth like lightning. The gift whereby thou hast deceived me shall be thine no more, she cried. Henceforward thou shalt be dumb till someone else has spoken, and then, even if thou wilt, thou shalt not hold thy tongue, but must needs repeat once more the last words that have been spoken. Alas, alas, cried the nymphs in chorus. Alas, alas, cried Echo after them, and could say no more though she longed to speak and beg Hera to forgive her. So did it come to pass that she lost her voice and could only say that which others put in her mouth, whether she wished it or no. Now it chanced one day that the young Narcissus strayed away from his companions in the hunt, and when he tried to find them he only wandered further and lost his way upon the lonely heights of Helicon. He was now in the bloom of his youth, nearing manhood, and fair as a flower in spring, and all who saw him straightway loved him and longed for him. But though his face was smooth and soft as maidens, his heart was hard as steel, and while many loved him and sighed for him, they could kindle no answering flame in his breast, but he would spurn them and treat them with scorn, and go on his way, nothing caring. When he was born, the blind seer, Tiresias, had prophesied concerning him. So long as he sees not himself, he shall live and be happy. And his words came true, for Narcissus cared for neither man nor woman, but only for his own pleasure. And because he was so fair that all who saw him loved him for his beauty, he found it easy to get from them what he would. But he himself knew not of love, and therefore but little of grief. For love at the best brings joy and sorrow hand in hand, and if unreturned it brings naught but pain. Now when the nymphs saw Narcissus wandering alone through the woods, they too loved him for his beauty, and they followed him wherever he went. But because he was a mortal, they were shy of him, and would not show themselves, but hid behind the trees and rocks so that he should not see them, and amongst the others Echo followed him too. At last, when he found he had really wandered astray, he began to shout for one of his companions. Ho there, where art thou? he cried. Where art thou? answered Echo. When he heard the voice, he stopped and listened, but he could hear nothing more, then he called again, I am here in the wood, Narcissus. In the wood, Narcissus, said she. Come hither, he cried. Come hither, she answered. Wondering at the strange voice which answered him, he looked all about but could see no one. Art thou close at hand, he asked. Close at hand, answered Echo. Wondering the more at seeing no one, he went forward in the direction of the voice. Echo, when she found he was coming towards her, fled further, so that when next he called, her voice sounded far away. But wherever she was, he still followed after her, and she saw that he would not let her escape, for wherever she hid, if he called, she had to answer, and so show him her hiding place. By now they had come to an open space in the trees where the green lawn sloped down to a clear pool in the hollow. Here by the margin of the water she stood with her back to the tall nodding bulrushes 
and as Narcissus came out from the trees, she wrung her hands, and the salt tears dropped from her eyes, for she loved him and longed to speak to him, and yet she could not say a word. When he saw her, he stopped. Art thou she who calls me? he asked. Who calls me? she answered. I have told thee, Narcissus, he said. Narcissus, she cried, and held out her arms to him. Who art thou? he asked. Who art thou? said she. Have I not told thee? he said impatiently. Narcissus. Narcissus, she said again, and still held out her hands beseechingly. Tell me, he cried, who art thou, and why dost thou call me? Why dost thou call me? said she. At this he grew angry. Maiden, whoever thou art, thou hast led me a pretty dance through the woods, and now thou dost naught but mock me. Thou dost naught but mock me, said she. At this he grew yet more angry, and began to abuse her. But every word of abuse that he spoke, she hurled back at him again. At last, tired out with his wanderings and with anger, he threw himself on the grass by the pool and would not look at her nor speak to her again. For a time, she stood beside him weeping and longing to speak to him and explain, but never a word could she utter. So at last, in her misery, she left him and went and hid herself behind a rock close by. After a while, when his anger had cooled down somewhat, Narcissus remembered he was very thirsty, and noticing for the first time the clear pool beside him, he bent over the edge of the bank to drink. As he held out his hand to take the water, he saw looking up towards him a face which was the fairest face he had ever looked on, and his heart, which never yet had known what love was, at last was set on fire by the face in the pool. With a sigh, he held out both his arms towards it, and the figure also held out two arms to him, an echo from the rock answered back his sigh. When he saw the figure stretching out towards him and heard the sigh, he thought his love was returned, and he bent down closer to the water and whispered, I love thee. I love thee, answered Echo from the rock. At these words, he bent down further and tried to clasp the figure in his arms, but as he did so, it vanished away. The surface of the pool was covered with ripples, and he found he was clasping empty water to his breast. So he drew back and waited a while, thinking he had been over hasty. In time, the ripples died away, and the face appeared again as clear as before, looking up at him longingly from the water. Once again, he bent towards it and tried to clasp it and once again it fled from his embrace. Time after time he tried, and always the same thing happened, and at last he gave up in despair, and sat looking down into the water with the teardrops falling from his eyes, and the figure in the pool wept too, and looked up at him with a look of longing and despair. The longer he looked, the more fiercely did the flame of love burn in his breast, till at length he could bear it no more, but determined to reach the desire of his heart or die. So for the last time he leaned forward, and when he found that once again he was clasping the empty water, he threw himself from the bank into the pool, thinking that in the depths at any rate he would find his love. But he found naught but death among the weeds and stones of the pool, and knew not that it was his own face he loved reflected in the water below him. Thus were the words of the prophet fulfilled, So long as he sees not himself, he shall live and be happy. Echo, peeping out from the rock, saw all that had happened, and when Narcissus cast himself into the pool, she rushed forward, 
all too late to stop him. When she found she could not save him, she cast herself on the grass by the pool and wept and wept till her flesh and her bones wasted away with weeping, and naught but her voice remained and the curse that was on her. So to this day she lives, a formless voice haunting rocks and caves and vaulted halls. Herself no man has seen since the day Narcissus saw her wringing her hands for love of him beside the nodding bulrushes, and no man ever shall see again. But her voice we all have heard repeating our words when we thought that no one was by, and though now she will say whatever we bid her, if once the curse were removed, the cry of her soul would be, Narcissus, Narcissus, my love, come back, come back to me. By the side of the clear brown pool, on the grass the echo had watered with her tears, there sprang up a sweet-scented flower with a pure white face and a crown of gold. And to this day, in many a land, men call that flower Narcissus, after the lad who, for the love of his own fair face, was drowned in the waters of Helicon. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Fighting Moose Podcast. Please join us next time as we read another exciting story. Today's music was provided by the artist Analog by Nature, and the audio clips were provided from NASA. For more information to download and or listen to audio or materials from all our recordings, or to contact us, please visit www.thefightingmoose.com, or you can follow the links in the show notes. If you enjoy the podcast, please leave us a review wherever you get your podcast or on iTunes and tell a friend. Thank you for your patronage, and as always, try and do a random act of kindness every day. Mission complete, Houston. After uh, serving the world for over 30 years, the space shuttle turned its place in